We have a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that's a summation of all that we've been saying for the past few months now in Christian prosperity. Because it's so inclusive in what the Apostle Paul says. And so I want to begin, and I want you to see this firmly in 1 Corinthians 3, to make sure that you have heard in the right manner all that we've said thus far in Christian prosperity. You can't cut any corners or it's not prosperity then. Prosperity, remember, means an abundance of all things in all areas. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 21. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Now that's pretty inclusive in what he says there. And don't think that we're trying to misinterpret the verse. Hold on, we're going to read the next two verses. But we're going to stay for a moment with verse 21 for all. All things are yours. All things. Someone always says whenever you read a passage like that, you'll always hear someone say, well, what does that mean? You know, it's just because it's so outstanding and overwhelming that they want to know, well, what does that really mean? Well, I'm sorry. I didn't look in, on any commentaries about this one. And there's really not any comments I could give on that. I mean, he says, for all things are yours. He answers the question, what? All things. He answers the question, to whom? You. Yours. Whoever's reading this. What's mine? Whatever, what, what is it that you're wanting, that you're desiring, that you're claiming out there, that you're believing for? What is it out there? Well, he says all things are yours. How many of those things, you say? How many of those things? I've got a list of 14. He said all of them. The church won't tell you that, but the Bible will. It'll tell you you can have maybe half of them. We'll split the difference. You can have half of those things on your list. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, that's not what he said. For all things are yours. You're going to have to make up your mind. You're going to believe the word about prosperity. If you want to have it in your life. Come on, what is it that you're wanting? Well, it's part of all things then. Amen. What is it that you're claiming? Don't give me this. Oh, medieval ascetic ideas that the church has tried to give us for so long. Yeah. It sounds good. It sounds like you're a pious person if you say things like that, but it's not Bible. Yeah. And Paul's not going to contradict himself somewhere else in the New Testament. Neither is the Holy Spirit who inspired this. Because he said all things. Wow. All things are yours. Whether Paul, well, he said I belong to you. Me and all that's mine, me and all that I know, me and all that I have. Apollos or Cephas or the world, that's a huge planet that we're on. He said it's yours. The whole world is yours. Life, that belongs to you. Life. Death, he said even that belongs to you. The sense that it no longer has the power over a Christian that it has over the world. Death is the end for the world, but not for the believer. Amen. Death is yours. You've conquered it by faith in Christ. You've conquered all of the evil effects of death. Amen. Say, well, he's talking about all those future things. Well, we just read life. That's now. Amen. Death is future. Hallelujah. That's yours. He said, now life is yours. You can claim that for all types of different things. But if that isn't enough, People say he's talking about future things or past things. Paul, Apollos, and Cephas would be past things. Well, he gives us not only the present tense, but he uses the word present or things present. Now, you look at that and what he says in verse 22. He says, whether Paul, Apollos, Cephas, he said, whether one or the other or all of them, he said, all are yours. The world, life, death, or things present. Whatever is present out there is yours. You can't measure the power of God by the extent of your bank account. He's not limited by that. Things present or things to come, something in the future. Now he's going to say it again. He's going to say it again. All, all is yours. Everything belongs to you. 
Thank you, Jesus. Well, if you're not living it out there, don't blame me or don't blame God. Amen. Just blame yourself. Don't blame the devil either now. You've got power over him. Amen. He's yours. He didn't include that here except under things present. He's present. He's yours. That Amen. is to the sense that in the sense that you can keep him just as bound as you desire to keep him bound. He's Amen. yours. Amen. All Amen. things are yours. So blame yourself, not us. Oh, there are lots of conditions. There's lot, there are a lot of conditions, and we've been covering some of those, and they're covered all the time. Amen. And no, there aren't a list of four of them, or even 40 of them. Where are they there from? Genesis to Revelation. Hallelujah. Give me a list of 27 of them. Uh, I could start with 27, but someone else could find 27 more. Amen. You've got the basic faith series on tape that we did several years ago. There are the basic conditions for faith. We said ground your faith in the word. Well, here's a good place to ground your faith for prosperity. All things are yours. You've got to ask for it. Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, ye have not because ye ask not. He didn't say he's obligated to just give things because you, he thinks that you think that you would kind of like to have it. He wants to know where your faith is, and you generally express where your faith is by claiming something. This is what I want. Be willing to confess it. Be willing to act on your faith. Be willing to endure with the Word. But the very first condition we said is ground your faith in the Word. You could be grounding your faith in the Word. You found a promise here, but maybe you're not totally grounded in the Word in some other area. So those are the basic conditions that cover everything. You have to have all grounded in the Word of God. And when you do, then there's, there's no magical formula. Things will just begin to work for you whenever you're grounded in the Word. Your faith and your life all together are grounded in the Word. It's easy to look around and wonder about someone else, maybe someone else in the church or something, but you don't know what that person does while they're at home. Maybe that's why things aren't working for them. Oh, they really look spiritual whenever they come here. And why isn't they don't have this or they don't have that or whatever well you never know what's going on in the person's life at home or on the job or wherever Amen. that's why you just have to keep your eyes on the word of god Amen. and not on failures of men men always fail but god never fails men the best of them try to tell the truth all the time but it's not truth that you can found your life upon like you can in the word of god because here's something you can found your life upon. All things are mine. You can go around saying that. He gives you the right. This is his word. To go around saying all things are mine. It's mine. Mark 11, 24. It's mine now. Which of those things are you claiming? Well, you can just skip down there and just, just go ahead and take things present for right now. Things present. Things present. All things present. Again, someone will, will ask you, well, what does that mean? Things present is what it means. Whatever is present would be a part of all things that are things present. Whatever is future would be a part of all things that are things to come. Praise God. Amen. Whether it's past, present, or future, it's still covered under all things are yours, verse 21. Verse 22, for the second time, all are yours. Well, let's study the context of what he's saying. That's fine. Go ahead and study the context. And he gave you the context with the first three things that are yours here in verse 22. Paul, Apollos, and Cephas. There's the context. But he's going beyond that to include more things. He just, kind of like Paul just takes off the world, life, death, things present, things to come. Everything is yours. No sense in putting a period after Cephas or Peter. He said, Paul, his ministry is yours. The ministry of Apollos is yours. The ministry of Cephas is yours. He writes to him back in the first chapter, why argue over the three of us when we all belong to you? Because we all belong to the Lord. But then he doesn't stop there. Then he says, well, let's get off this ministry business. The world is yours. Life is yours. Death is yours. What, what more could you ask for than, than the world, life, death, things present, things to come, everything? You know, he picked out just enough words to cover everything. All are yours, verse 23. Ye are Christ, you belong to him, and Christ is God's. 
You know, we've looked some in Deuteronomy on several occasions. We'll look again in Deuteronomy where <clears throat> Moses said the same thing to Israel that all things belong to you. You have to make up your mind this is what you're going to have. You're not going to live on the subsistence level. You're not going to live on the poverty level. You're going to live where the king lives. He lives with everything. Everything belongs to him. Those aren't just figures of speech in the Bible. Those aren't just figments of the imagination of faith teachers today. We just covered it as about as inclusively as possible in just looking at what Paul said, just reading what he said. All things, all things belong to you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. That's healing. That's, that's automobiles. That's homes. That's clothes. That's food. That's everything. Whatever is all. All things are yours. I trust you'll get a revelation tonight in what belongs to you. There are no limits. He said that. There are no limits. There's no limit on the word all. All means all things. All things belong to you. So you have to get your faith and your mind grounded in the word of God so you can begin to ask according to the word of God. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, it's only when you pray according to his will, which is according to his word, that your prayers are heard and moreover, that your prayers are answered. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask some things, no, we're back to that all-inclusive word, and we're talking about another New Testament writer. It wasn't just Paul off on this tangent. John said this. If we ask something, no, if we ask anything according to his will, then he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions, that we have, past tense from after you say the word have, that we have the petitions that we desired of him. It's a petition that we're back to Matthew 7, you have not because you ask not. Jesus said you've got to ask to receive. That we have the petitions that we desire of him. But that's in praying according to the will of God. And we're always encouraging you to know the word so that you can pray according to his will. Amen. Because you'll just be spinning your wheels, as they say, if you're praying outside of the word of God because it's outside of his will. What happens to those prayers are kind of like hot air balloons. Just go up into the atmosphere and who knows where they end up. They certainly don't end up at the throne. Because if they end up at the throne, then you get the things that you petition the Lord for. Remember the saints in the word of God do. Abraham, remember the patriarchs. We've looked at all that before. We're just summing up. We're not going to go back over all that except to remind you so that the devil doesn't plant thoughts of unbelief in your mind or those thoughts of, well, what about or what if or the exception thoughts in a person's mind. The kings of Israel, the ones who were righteous before God, they had all things because they were believing the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. We've looked in Deuteronomy before, such as in chapter 8, Hallelujah. beginning with uh, verse 7. We've looked here before. We'll look again and see if all things for Israel included all things. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water. They had to have water. They had to have brooks of water. They didn't have indoor plumbing. They had to have brooks of water. They had to have lots of them. Or otherwise, everybody just camp out in one spot. Fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and the hills. That means you could live up on the mountains or down in the valley. You could take either place. You'll be springs of water. Springs of water in the valleys and in the hills. That's everywhere. A land of wheat and barley. Vines, fig trees, pomegranate. Land of oil, olive, and honey. Some of the very basic staples of Israel, things that she needed, things that she used many different ways in her life. Hallelujah. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. That's the subsistence level. We're just barely getting by. And look at the middle of this verse. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. Anything is the same as all things. It's just that the NY substitutes for the double L. It's the same thing. Anything is the same thing as Paul's all things. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. 
a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. Well, we see there Israel wasn't some Stone Age culture. She was living before the so-called Iron Age and the so-called Bronze Age. She had both of them right at the same time and evidently, evidently knew how to use them. Hallelujah. Amen. Or they'd say to Moses, Iron, what's iron? Me use stones. What's bronze or brass? Me use flint heads. <coughs> they must have known what he was talking about. Amen. And back in chapter 6, we look beginning with verse 10 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears> this <throat> shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers. Remember, all of this in the Old Testament just serves as a shadow of the new and better covenant, Hebrews 8, 6. A new and better covenant based on better promises because we've got a better mediator than Moses. Moses was the Old Testament mediator between God and the people. And Hebrews 8, 6 says we've got a new mediator, a better one, which means we've got a new and better covenant. To Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. They didn't get just houses. They got the whole town. He gave them the whole town. He gave them the victory over the people, and they slaughtered them, and he just gave them cities, entire complete cities. That takes a long time to build. Houses, empty ones, houses full of all good things. Hallelujah. You take out the word good, and there you've got it again, all things. Or leave the word good in so you know he's not talking about bad things. We already know that. The church tells us he'll bless you with all things as long as you put the word bad in between all and things. But we got the word good. Houses, not empty houses. Not houses that are full of all cobwebs and cockroaches, <laughs> but houses full of all good things, Preach, which thou fillest not. They just took over everything. Amen. Don't do mental gymnastics with the Bible in your minds now. Amen. This is what he said. He must be trying to get across a point here. And wells dig, which take a long time, which thou diggest not. Vineyards, olive trees, which thou plantest not. And then he gives them the warning, don't forget the Lord. And we don't hesitate giving the warning because it's over there in Deuteronomy 8 as well. We just didn't read down that far. When you've eaten and you're full, then beware lest you forget the Lord, which gave you all these things that you have. He's the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You're to fear the Lord your God, serve him, and swear by his name, and don't swear by the names of the other gods that you've been prone to do in the past. Then over in chapter 2 of Deuteronomy, chapter 2, let's see, verse 36. Some more of these promises in Deuteronomy that all things would belong to them if they had believed the word of God. From a rower which is by the brink of the river of Arnon, and from the city that is by the river, even unto Gilead, there was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all unto us. They just took everything. How would you like to have been Old Testament Israel there? You've got to march upon these huge cities with, well, you see down there in verse 5 of the next chapter, where there are high walls, their gates, their bars, they're fenced right up to heaven. And you've got to march right up to that. And somehow you've got to believe that God's going to give you that city. That's impregnable. Like Jericho. Take Jericho. We're told over in Joshua chapter 6 verse 1 that Jericho was shut up, none came out, and none went in. An impenetrable fortress. Impregnable. Indomitable. And yet, by faith, they did what God told them to do which amounted to marching around the city, giving the shout on the final time, and the walls came tumbling down. Oh, it's easy to study the stories. It's a little more difficult to put yourself in Israel's place. Yeah. It's easy to criticize others until you put yourself in their place. Don't be quick to criticize, oh, Israel and her unbelief, because it'd be a temptation to be doubting as you're walking around these impenetrable walls. What are we doing walking around them? We're supposed to be going through these things. <laughs> Or over the top of them, you know, transport us by the Spirit or something, but not walking around them. 
And Israel was just trusting God. No, she wasn't looking for a chink in the wall. She didn't have her architects out investigating the best place to <laughs> shout so the reverberation of their voices would send an earthquake and shatter the town walls. It was all a supernatural miracle. And yet you put yourself in their place and you see how much of a miracle it really was. And they could put themselves in your place right now and see that it's going to be a miracle for you to have the things that you're going to have. The Lord our God delivered all unto us. Then early in the chapter, verse 7, For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth that walking through this great wilderness, these 40 years, the Lord thy God hath been with thee, and thou hast <laughs> lacked nothing. There we go again, everything. Nothing, just the opposite of everything. And if you lacked nothing, it meant that you had everything. You had all things. She didn't always have them exactly when she wanted them, but she always got them. It took some of the faith of the other people around her just for her to have them, but be that as it may, the Word of God still says that she had all things. She didn't lack anything. Supernatural, totally supernatural provision for Israel in the Old Testament. We've looked over in Romans chapter 8, in, over in the New Testament, and another one of these promises that have been provided by the Holy Spirit through the writings of the Apostle Paul. We find again what we might call the scope of our inheritance. The scope of our inheritance is all things. Mm -hmm. Verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Praise God. All things. Oh, Lord. We've said in a message before, the son was the greatest gift that he could ever have given. And Paul's argument, Paul's deductive argument is, if he's given that, then why wouldn't he? And the answer is, why he would. Why wouldn't he give you everything that's less than the son? Amen. It's a good argument. It's a very good argument. It's more than just a logically deductive one because it's in the Word of God. It means it was inspired by the Spirit of God. And according to spiritual wisdom, he always does everything logically. logically. Not according to natural wisdom, but according to spiritual wisdom, everything. He's not illogical in what he does, unreasonable. Just to the natural carnal mind, sometimes it's hard to comprehend, but not when you see the Word of God. Then it only makes sense. This only makes sense. He... Well, we could go back up to uh, verse, we could go back up to verse 30. Whom he did predestinate, them he called, whom he called, them he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Oh, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, then who can be against us? Amen. No one was against Israel as long as God was with her and as long as she was with God in the Old Testament. No one was against her. She overcame all. Then we get to verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Freely give us all things. So now that's saying the same, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 21, that's saying the same, all of these passages are saying the same as what we've seen to begin with over in 1 Corinthians 3.21. That's a good thing just to go around telling yourself, all things are mine. Doesn't matter what the devil says. All things are mine. All is mine because you've got it in verse 21 and you've got it again in verse 22. Those things that Israel got, by the way, were things present. At her time, verse 22, towards the end of verse 22, they were things present for her. Things to come again in verse 22. We're trying to emphasize the point. All, all, all things, all are yours. Now the question is, are you going to limit God? He said all things are yours. The church tries to limit him with a lot of misappropriation of certain Bible verses. And yet it's the same Bible that says all things are yours. So the question is, are you going to limit him in giving all things? He doesn't limit himself, but you can limit him. 
He doesn't limit himself. He says all, all is yours, all belongs to you. Now, if you don't have all, he's not going to go back on his word. There'd be no sense in saying all is yours and then say, but I'm going to keep some things that are not for you. He said all is yours. So if you don't have all things, then the limitation must be in some other area. It's not from his side. All things are yours. We just saw there in Romans 8, 32, that he's given the son the best gift that he can, could, could have given. He gave his best to his best. And so why not be willing to give something less than that? Jesus uses the same argument over in Mark chapter 2 for divine healing. He says, I forgave this man his sins. Now, if I've done that, why not heal his body? Because the saving of the soul is a lot greater feat indeed than the healing of the body. He uses the same argument that Paul does, Romans 8, 32, over in the first few verses of Mark chapter 2. Now, you've got to keep in mind, well, let's, let's look at a passage. All things are yours. Why is all yours? Let me tell you why. You ready for a, a big revelation? Amen. It's one you already know now. All things are yours because all things are his. Amen. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Amen. All things are yours because all is his. You see, if he didn't own it, then he couldn't guarantee you that you own it. That'd be impossible. Amen. He'd have to go steal it from someone else. Only reason he can guarantee that all things are yours is because all things are his. Amen. For instance, right. Psalm 50, beginning with verse 10. Here we're going to find out some of those all things that belong to him. And he said, as a result, they belong to you. We'll probably be looking at a lot of verses tonight as they come to mind because we want to go back over some that we've looked at. And I don't think we've mentioned this one, some that we haven't looked at. Psalm 50 and verse 10. Every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle upon a thousand hills. And cattle, cattle are made out of more than McDonald's hamburgers. I think really those are made out of soybeans, but anyway, we'll, we'll pretend like they're made from cattle. And what about verse 15? Call upon me in the day of trouble. I'll deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Praise so he said all belongs to him. He said every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle upon a thousand hills. Look over in Proverbs, Proverbs for a moment. Proverbs, we'll come back to Psalms. I remember a verse over in Proverbs 13. Well, I remember a lot of verses. I remember one we were talking about recently. <laughs> the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. We were just there in the 22nd verse last time. Hope you've been thinking about that. The wealth of all of those sinners out there. We remember Ecclesiastes 2.26. Uh, I guess I could say even above Proverbs 13.22 because it tells us, it sets the two against one another and says that to the man that's good in his sight, he gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he gives travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 26. Which was a verse we used in connection with Proverbs 13, 22, that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. But I wanted to get down to that last verse since we were talking about cattle, food. Only reason you need cattle is because of food. Or milk, but it's still things that you eat. Verse 25. The righteous eateth to the satisfying of his soul. That means not only do you have plenty to eat, but you're satisfied with what you eat. You don't get stuck with hot dogs all the time. That's not going to satisfy your soul. You're going to get weary. <laughs> you're going to get very weary of that very quickly. Unless you've got a strange chemical system down in your stomach. Not to get tired of those things after a while. Oh, they're all right to throw on the grill during the summertime and eat a couple of them, but that's probably all you better eat. They just seem to swell up in your stomach if you eat too many of them. You feel bloated like a dead fish on a, on a creek bank if you eat too many of them. Well, that shouldn't satisfy you. It shouldn't satisfy you. The belly of the wicked shall lack. 
the belly of the wicked. Why? Well, verse 22, they've been giving you all their food, evidently. <laughs> That's what he says. It's right in the same context here. Back over in the book of Psalms. Psalm 34. For the continuation of this message, the belly of the wicked shall lack. The belly of the wicked. Why? Well, verse 22, they've been giving you all their food, evidently. <laughs> That's what he says. It's right in the same context here. Back over in the book of Psalms. Psalm 34. Psalm 34, beginning with verse 8. Peter calls these over in 2 Peter chapter 1, exceeding great and precious promises. See how exceeding they are. They're just so exceeding. They're not limited. The church limits God, but God doesn't limit himself. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. The Lord is good. That jolly green giant might not be very good, but the Lord is good. The stores have a lot packaged in cans that, well, it gets old on you after a while. Just, it just doesn't satisfy you. There's nothing there. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. There's no lack to them that fear him. We just read in Proverbs 13, there's a lack to the belly of the wicked. But there's no lack to them that fear him. Even the lions out there, God takes care of them with his providence most of the time. But even the young lions lack on occasion is what he means. He goes on to say over in Psalm 104 that he takes care of even the lions. But in his providence, sometimes they lack and suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord suffer hunger. Notice the word. But they that seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. We're back to any good thing again. Or all good things. It reads the same. All good things belong to you. Chapter 37, verse 25. I'm just reading all these until I can build up and say what I think the Lord wants me to say. <laughs> I've said it before. I'm just going to remind you again. I've been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Never seen the righteous forsaken. David said, I've never seen the righteous having to beg bread. That is because they don't have enough. Uh, Proverbs 10 and verse 3. There's a lot of promises in Proverbs and in Psalms for temporal material blessings. We're not talking, remember, in all of these teachings that we've done on Christian prosperity, we're not talking about spiritual blessings. That, that comes under another connection when you study some other subject. We're studying one particular subject, and it concerns the material physical world. Proverbs 10 and verse 3, The Lord shall not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. Oh, there's so many verses here. You can go over to chapter uh, 13 and verse 2, A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressor shall eat violence. We looked at verse 7 before. There is that make himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that make himself poor, yet hath great riches. All these are just promises in general. Those there are promises in general for prosperity. Back in Psalm, the book of Psalms, chapter 35, verse 27. Let the Lord be magnified that hath pleasure in your prosperity. Amen. He has pleasure in your prosperity. Praise the Lord. If you're, a, if you're a servant of his, he has pleasure in your prosperity. Doesn't please the father whenever you're living in poverty. Doesn't please you when your child lives in poverty, does it? No. Grieves your heart. And if you can, if they're still under your roof and you have the wherewithal, if you can, you're going to make sure their needs are met. It's generally known. It's just a common trait of humanity that, that parents go, uh, go without a lot of things if the child has need of it. They let the child have it first of all because of their love and their concern for their own offspring. 
Well, you see, what I'm saying is God has so much that he never has to go without anything to make sure that you can have everything because he's turned all of it over to you because he doesn't need any of it. He doesn't need the cattle on a thousand hills. What do you think it says? He says it over there. He doesn't need any of them. He doesn't eat meat. <laughs> he doesn't drink milk. Why well, say that unless the, the import is since they belong to me, and you belong to me, then whatever I have, you have. That's just the way that it works. Whatever you own, your child owns. The house is his. The house that you own, it's your child's home. He doesn't knock on the door and ask me he sleep there that night. It's his. All those expensive things that you bought that sometimes you warn them, be careful with whenever you touch them or get too close to them. All those are his. He doesn't ask, you know, may I borrow my bed for tonight? Or could I just have a pillow out in the doghouse? I'll sleep out there tonight. No, he just walks right in. And guess what? He doesn't feel like he's imposing on you. Why? It's his home. If it's your home, it's his home. Same thing is true with our Heavenly Father. More, Jesus said in Matthew 7, more. Because he said, if you being evil know how to give good things to your children, then how much more? shall your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? Yeah. How much more? Everything that he owns, you own as well. Is your grocery budget $25 a week? Well, his is bigger than that. Is your grocery bu budget hot dogs every night? His is bigger than that. He owns all the cattle or the hogs. You can have whatever you want on a thousand hills. A thousand hills. That'd take a long time to count all of them. Long time to count all the cattle on a thousand hills. How many is on each hill? Hills, some hills can hold lots of cattle. And it doesn't mean that if you found a thousand and one hill, then that wouldn't be his. That's his too. Just don't make the mistake of some people in trying to figure out how many cattle by counting the horns and then dividing by two. Just stay with what he said, that however many are on all the hills out there, they all belong to me. All of them. You really believe that? You see, too many people read the Bible, they think that the Bible is just to get us into heaven to save our soul. That's what the whole teaching of the church is. That nothing is for now. Everything was either for back then or for out there. Nothing's for now. And, and, and if something were for now, it's, it's salvation. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's the Bible. You know, it's something like that. Something spiritual. You can't let your mind still be seduced and deceived in that area. Now go over to Romans 8 again. After saying all of that, I tell you what, on the way over there, since we're going to be passing by Haggai, let's just stop by there. Haggai 2 and verse 8. We'll stop by this to get in more than just food. Maybe your refrigerator is full. But the reason it's full is because your checking account's empty now. So we'll stop by something in between the cattle and Paul's words in Romans 8. Verse 8, Haggai 2. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. That was more or less money for them back then. They didn't have fiat money like this country prince. That was their money. So he said, the money's mine. It all belongs to me. Well, let's go back to Job before we get over to there, to Paul and Romans. Let's go back to Job 27 and see what Job had to say about the wicked over in Job 27, verses 16 and 17. We read this passage again the week before with the wealth of the sinner. Proverbs 13, 22. Job 27 and verse 16. Talking about verse 13, this is the portion of the wicked man with God. Here's his portion, some of it anyway. Though he heap up silver as the dust and prepare raiment as the clay, he may prepare it, but the just shall put it on and the innocent shall divide the silver. That is, it gets into the hands of the people of God. And from whom did they get it? From the wicked man who was just laboring away. Remember Ecclesiastes 2.26, just laboring away to heap up silver and to prepare all these nice, nice clothes. He said that they've got silver like the dust and they've got their clothes like the clay. 
the clay of the creek bank. There's so much of it. He said that's how much silver, that's, that's how much, how many garments they have. But he said, all of it belongs to me. And therefore, verse 17, that wicked one may prepare it, but you're going to put it on. And the innocent's going to take over his silver. You know, it was a blessing when I got several months ago or whenever that was. I got a whole box of silver in the mail from someone. And I wasn't claiming any silver, but, you know, I got that, and I'd forgotten all about it. Even I forgot about it even when we were teaching on what we were saying last week. But there it is. There's a verse for it right there. Because it was, it was from an individual that's, that's not in this walk like I'm in this walk. Just a whole box of silver. Silver is valuable. And not only was it just, just financial blessing, money, but it was literal silver, just like the Bible said. That the wicked will just heap it up like dust, but the innocent will get to divide it. You know, divide it out and get all the dimes and the quarters and the half a dollars. And I haven't even done that yet. I just stuck it all in the box and filed it away somewhere. But there's a lot of money and silver in there. <laughs> because a half a dollar of silver is worth more than a half a dollar, of course. You can have one of those fake copper ones today, and all it's worth is a half a dollar. But you can have one of the real ones, and it's worth more than what it says on face value. Go cash it in somewhere. Oh, I probably will one of these days. You're going to wait till you get desperate? I'm not ever going to get desperate. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's why people save it. But if you don't watch out, there the market goes down. And then it's not worth anything but a half a dollar, if that much. It may even be worth less than that. Well, praise the Lord. I'll spend it for whatever it's worth then. You know, I was really, I was really into collecting coins back whenever I was a lost youth. And, oh, I had spent a lifetime collecting a lot of coins. I mean, I had some... Some very interesting ones. I'm not talking about $500,000 ones or anything like that. I wouldn't be here preaching. I'd be out making millions of dollars or something if I had coins like that. But anyway, I had an extensive collection. Whenever I got saved, I just lost a desire for all that stuff. Amen. I sold that whole thing for $100. I had some coins worth $100, just one coin. You know, some ones back in 1857 and so forth. I sold the whole, I found someone who'd give me $100. And, you know, I wanted, I wanted the burden lifted off me of having to, to make sure all those coins are protected somewhere at home, you know, so someone wouldn't break in and steal them or, or I wouldn't misplace one of those rare dimes that I had or something. I thought that, that he was doing me a favor of taking them off my hands. Not that I was doing him a favor by giving him a tremendous discount. Him, I didn't want the things. Well, it shows I've lost my affection for all these rare silver and gold coins. I didn't want the things anymore. Hallelujah. Because they're going to all be burned up when Jesus comes back. Amen. So you might as well spend them now is the point. Amen. It might have been minted in 1857. But the year 2057 may never come for it to celebrate a 200th anniversary. <laughs> so you might as well just go ahead and spend it now. Amen. Oh, there are mongers out there looking for these coins. Looking, I had a rare stamp collection, not as valuable as my coin one. I still got that, but... It's traveled so many places, gone through so many changes of, of temperature and humidity, I, I would hate to open it and see what's still left on the inside. Because, you know, you've got to really protect those stamps. Whenever that humidity changes, and your stamps really begin to change. i still got it stashed somewhere. I only vaguely remember where it is. But it's outside, though, you know, below freezing outside. I didn't put it under my mouth. I could care less. The thing rots out there. <laughs> You see, I'm telling you, some of us are blessed because we don't have affection for things like that. You have to lose your affection for stuff like that. The only thing that would be worth anything for is to go sell it and get some money and then get some use out of, out of your stamp collection that you've got there. It doesn't give you any use just sitting outside. But I don't want to go to the trouble of trying to sell the thing, though. It would take too much time to do that. I'd rather just let it rot and believe God for some money without having to go sell my stamp collection. <laughs> I knew where my coin collection was because I had whole big volumes of all these coins. You know, you had to get them put in little plastic containers. If you nick the coin, it's not a proof coin anymore. That coin goes down as soon as you nick that coin. It's not a minted proof coin anymore. So not all of mine were, well, I did, most of mine weren't proofs or mints because if they're like that, they're really valuable. They've never touched another coin. You've gotten them as soon as they've come off the press, and they've never been nicked by a coin. 
I mean, you take a coin out of your pocket, and you're going to see little tiny scrapes all over it. Get a magnifying glass, and there'll be scrapes and dents and scratches all over that. It may be in 1857, but uh, it's not as valuable, I would say, as an 1857 proof mint coin that's never touched another coin, never been dented like that. It's just a perfect specimen of a coin. And people spend a lifetime looking for things like that, digging for things like that with metal detectors. I went through all of that. Spent so many hours listening to little beeps in my ears. <laughs> Most of it was nothing but bottle tops that you'd find. You got to the place, you just curse every time you'd find a bottle top. You'd dig it up. <laughs> you know, because it's rare when you find a coin. But you go out on, you know, some football field somewhere, you know, where the kids at school play football, and there's coins out there, lots of coins out there. People running around throwing football, lots of coins out there. And if it's been around long enough, then you're going to find some valuable. Well, anyway, Haggai 2.8, all of it, he says, belongs to me. Amen. All the silver is mine, all the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Now over to Romans 8. And this is what he said, what we've been saying about you, Romans 8. And verse 17. If you're children, then you're heirs. You're heirs of God, and then God turned everything over to his son. And you're joint heirs with Christ. You're joint heirs with the son. You're a joint heir with him. What does he own? Well, the question is, what doesn't he own? Galatians, Galatians chapter 4. Praise the Lord. I trust you're listening again tonight. Yeah. Galatians chapter 4. Beginning with verse 6. Because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Jesus Christ. And what does this heir, joint heir business mean? Well, it means what we've been saying in maybe a uh, language that's a little easier to understand. Whatever he owns is what you own, and that's why he can say in 1 Corinthians 3, all things are yours. He couldn't say it unless all belong to him. But because everything is his. Say, well, it belongs to someone else. Well, even that person belongs to the Lord. His life, his breath, his very existence, oh, Acts 17, yeah, yeah. is owned by God. <laughs> so anything he owns, he only owns it in a secondary sense because God owns him. And if, you own, if he owns him, it means he owns all of his possessions. Now, how could you argue, some people still do, against all that we've been looking at just Amen. tonight? Amen. It's kind of a review of all that we've said thus far. How could you argue with that? A lot of people do out there. But I don't want to talk about a lot of people out there. I want to talk about a lot of people right here. You might not be arguing with it doctrinally, but are you arguing with it as far as experience in your own life? Or at least in the concepts of your own mind? How could you dare limit him when he's given you the right to go around saying, all things belong to me, whatever I want? I can have. Psalm 37 and verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee all things that you desire. Amen. He said that he'll give you the desires of your heart. Oh, amen. But I'm telling you, if you've been raised in, in lower class or even in middle class America, and I don't know if any of you have been checking up on what I've been saying, but I mean, I mean this with all my heart, and I mean it comes as a revelation whenever you think about it. If you've been raised, even in middle-class America, everything that you've been raised with has always been a substitute. You have to face that fact. If you'll just spend a little time, go in a store you don't normally go in. Find one down on Fifth Avenue in New York or wherever. Go in a store you don't normally go in and find out what the real things are like. 
I'm talking about from your shoes to your socks to your pants to your billfold to your dress to everything. Now, you know this is true if you've done any looking around at all. You know what I'm talking about. And you see, uh, I'm enlightening you to this fact because how in the world can you stay in a rut like that and still be saying all things are mine? What you're saying is all counterfeits are mine. What you're saying are all substitutes are mine. You're saying all things that aren't the real thing are mine. He didn't say that. I said that he gave his best to his best. His children aren't substitutes. The world would be a substitute. Church members are substitutes for true Christianity. But he gave his best to his best. His best, first of all, included his own son, and then according to Romans 8, 32, includes everything less than him. Everything. You say, does it include anything above him? There's not anything above him, so we can forget about that realm. It's everything less than him, which is everything. All things. And if you haven't done a little investigation, then you don't even know what I'm talking about. Or maybe you have, and maybe you only kind of on the surface know what I'm talking about. That you're, you've been ray shopping at Woolworths for furniture. Target for cars. You know, that type of mentality. Well, these big stores have sprung up. You know which ones I'm talking about. That are the one-stop store. You can buy everything there. And guess what? Just about all of it's going to be counterfeit. Now, if you want something to wipe the snow off your car, I wouldn't go buy something rare on Rodeo Drive or something. Some of these places like Woolworths would be a good place to go buy something to scrape the snow off your car. When it comes to the shoes that you're going to be walking around in all the day that you're on the job, the clothes that you wear, the home that you live in. Sears used to sell homes. Sears did. Sears Robot. <laughs> used to sell homes where they'd sell a home. You put the whole home up back in the 40s. You know, they'd sell a whole home to you. One of the things come in a big package. You'd open the package and, and just begin to build the whole thing. There are lots of things like that today that are nothing but substitutes for the real thing. The same is true with most food out there. Most of it substitutes. The fast food chain business, it's a substitute business for the real thing. Why is it so strong? It's because America is so caught up in substitutes. So caught up. So caught up in taking, and they don't even know that it's substitutes. That's what I'm saying. When you were growing up, unless you were thinking about anything, you didn't know that your family was living substitutely. You didn't know that. Thought, I mean, I mean, this is this is a pair of pants. At least I'm not walking around on sackcloth on or something. But then, <laughs> and I'm not talking about you used to walk around in a pair of pants with 18 holes or something in them. I'm talking about nice pair, nice pair of double knit polyesters. <laughs> That's a contradiction of terms, by the way. <laughs> we could just go on and on with these examples of what the real thing is versus the counterfeit thing. You know, whenever we were working on our, on our other home, uh, I don't know how many people realize, I told some people, but I guess some people I never got around to talking to about the subject, but I said the reason that we're doing things the way that we are is, is for God's glory. It's a testimony to his word and what his will is. And, you know, we should all be like that in all of our life. You're an heir of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We should be like that as a testimony in our life to what Amen. the promises of God will do, Amen. that they're valid. Remember over in Matthew chapter 6. Let's get back over there for a moment. We've been there before, over in Matthew chapter 6. Dear friends, I've said before, and I don't know how many of you took me seriously, all these things are always up to you. You take us seriously or not. I must be serious or I wouldn't be wasting my time saying it, but that's, that's beside the point. You do with it how you see best, and I'll do with it how I see best. That you might as well get rid of all the junky trinkets around your home. You know that's exactly what is true in most people's home today. 
nothing but junky trinkets. <laughs> These fake pictures on the wall that are fake. <laughs> You're not going to have them in the kingdom. You're going to be wearing a pure white robe. Oh, yeah. The streets are paved with gold. Oh, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> You're not going to make it into the kingdom. You won't know what to do. You'll be afraid to walk on the street. <laughs> Amen. Because you're so used to all these substitutes. <laughs> You'll, he'll be showing you all these mansions, and you'll say, but, but yes, where's mine, though? <laughs> and the thing is, that will be yours that he's pointing to. You won't even know how to turn the doorknob. It'll be a real doorknob on there. <laughs> Well, everything will be like that. The gates are made out of pearls. You see, he's consistent, I'm saying, he's consistent with his own revelation here. That's not just all for the future. That's been patterned right in Abraham's life as an example. David's life, Solomon's life as an example. He's just consistent with himself in the afterlife of Revelation. Just read Revelation 21. It's all there right in one chapter, Revelation 21. All these foundations of this city made out of all these precious gems. He's not just trying to show off all that he has. That's what God is. He's not a counterfeit substitute God. So I've said before what we've just finished saying about junky trinkets. We don't really hardly have anything that we don't use around our house. A lot of people got lots of junk around their house. We've got, I mean, just a few boxes of things that aren't in the home. The rest of them get rid of. Assuming it's not something seasonable or whatever, obviously you've got to store that. But I'm talking about a lot of people's attics or basements or sheds are filled with a lot of junk, just a lot of literal junk. Old, worn-out sweatshirts, they just hate to part with the thing. They think one day I'll be working in the yard and I'll need that. And why is it packaged up and you'll never use it? <laughs> well, you must, you're responding evidently because you've got a sweatshirt at home somewhere in there. Just things packed up that you're never going to use. The quality of the box and the tape on it show you're never going to use that. Because it's been there for a long, long time. Why not, just, why not just be free and be a disciple and just throw it away? Just get rid of the junk. Now you say, well, my house will be empty. That's all right. Then you can start filling it with some of these things we're going to start talking about. We've already been talking about them before. Then you can start filling it then. Oh, it'll be bare. Well, I don't know what would be worse, having a bare house or a house filled with junk. Didn't I say before that a lot of times a poor person's home has a lot more items, a lot more items than a rich person's home? It's because they're grasping for a straw. They want possession. And they think what will satisfy them is the number, the quantity, and not the quality of possessions. And so they're just little, you know, little, uh, they call them little knickknacks, just sitting everywhere. How much you pay for that? Five cents. Where would you get that? Woolworths. And there's hundreds of them around the home. Why not have one really nice piece of art? That's what you're trying to do is liven your house up with art. And if you don't think it's wrong to buy a five cent piece, then why not just buy a $500 piece? You just got one there. But it's real though. It's real. It's worth something. It's not something that you picked up one of those grab bag items. One of those five for a dollar where stores will have little baskets full of just a lot of junk. You can pick four of them for a dollar out of there. None of them, a hundred of them, a thousand of them are worth a dollar. It'd be worth a dollar for someone to set a match to all of this stuff. <laughs> this message will be continued on the following tape.